So now we've been looking at some of the proteins in the cell that are involved in cell signaling pathways. And we've discussed whether um, what function they play in a pathway and whether they're good targets for drugs. So now we'll look at this concept of whether a protein is druggable or undruggable. So will this protein, based on its structure, will it respond to a small um, organic molecule, that's the drug, or is, is there nowhere in this protein which would be a great target, but unfortunately we just can't make the target, and make the drug work for that protein. So let's have a look at this property of these proteins that make them druggable or not. So we've identified a target molecule, a target protein that we think we'd like to knock out with a drug. Now, before we can actually do this, the protein structure has to be known and we need to identify whether there's a domain within the structure of that protein which we can attack with the drug. So these potential targets, meaning our proteins, typically our oncoproteins, they can be targeted as druggable, meaning that they have a domain which the drug can attack. All these oncoproteins are considered to be not druggable. So even though they're a great target, we just can't get a, a drug to knock it out. Okay, so what's the properties of the protein? Is the protein druggable? We know it's a target, but can we actually design a drug for it? So a protein is considered druggable if it contains a, an identifiable enzymatic function. All right, um, typically Enzymatic sites are these sort of small clefts in the protein where something comes in and binds, okay? So if the protein has an identifiable, identifiable enzymatic function, then it's quite likely it has what's called a catalytic cleft, and then often you can target that pocket, that catalytic cleft in the protein, okay? Some proteins are considered to be undruggable because they lack this catalytic cleft. Okay, so if you consider a kinase um, activity, a kinase protein, for instance, then it's got a it's got a, a domain that binds ATP. Okay, and that domain that binds ATP is involved in the in the function, and you can target that cleft. Okay, if a protein is something like a transcription factor then that protein is binding to DNA and it doesn't do that through a catalytic cleft but it does it through a, a big surface that binds to the surface of DNA so there's no small area of interaction it's a large area of interaction and it's difficult to target that with a small molecule so if the drug so if the protein has a cleft a catalytic cleft then it's probably druggable. If it doesn't, then it's probably not druggable. Okay, there are exceptions, but that's probably a good way of thinking about it. So I showed at the end of one of those previous videos the structure of a drug called Gleevec. Okay, now Gleevec is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So we know that in the cell there's a range of proteins that have a tyrosine kinase activity. And we know that tyrosine kinase activities are often found in signaling pathways. So it should come of no surprise that people have designed small molecules to target these um, catalytic clefts in these oncoproteins that are tyrosine kinases. So this is just showing the three-dimensional structure of a particular tyrosine kinase it's showing there's a site in the kinase that I think would typically bind ATP, but in the place of ATP, Gleevec binds, and therefore it stops the ATP coming in, and therefore it stops the enzyme acting as a kinase. Okay. So this is looking at a, um, a cancer condition here where there's a, a very large cancer and part of this uncontrolled growth is driven by one of these tyrosine kinases. Okay? 
after treatment with Gleevec, the, um, the tyrosine kinase has been knocked out and the cell phenotype, the cell growth, has been reduced to what is effectively a normal condition. So a highly efficient outcome for a, um, a rationally designed drug that binds and targets an onco protein. It ta it, this drug targets a tyrosine kinase that was driving growth. You knock out the activity of that kinase, you knock out the growth phenotype of those cells. And I've got a little video here which just shows, um, gives us some background information on the structure and the cleft and the, how a small molecule fits into this protein. And this protein is a phosphoinositol 3 kinase. Phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase, or PI3 kinase, is a multi-domain enzyme. The structure of PI3 kinase, as determined by X-ray crystallography, is shown here as a ribbon diagram. Each domain of PI3 kinase is associated with distinct functions and colored differently. The RAS binding domain is shown in red. This domain enables RAS to directly activate the PI3 kinase catalytic domain. The catalytic domain is colored purple. Zooming into the catalytic domain, we enter the catalytic cleft and observe a drug molecule that inhibits normal PI3 kinase enzyme function. The inhibitor molecule blocks the catalytic site and prevents PI3 kinase from accessing its usual ATP substrate. In this view, we can see the complementary three-dimensional structures of the drug molecule and the walls of the surrounding catalytic cleft. Now let's think about another protein. We know that the RAS oncoprotein is involved in many cancers. There's, there's a high chance that there's a mutation in RAS. It's, an, it's a hyperactivation of the RAS protein. It's, so you think, well, if we can knock out the catalytic activity of RAS, then maybe we can reduce its hyperactivation. Okay? But it doesn't work for RAS. And if you think about RAS, it's fairly clear that it's not going to work for RAS. Okay? So we know RAS has an effector loop which is exposed. It's a big loop and it binds to another protein to activate it. Okay? So that loop is a part of the structure that changes when GTP is bound and or when GDP is bound. So depending on the nucleotide that's bound, you get a different structure for RAS. Okay? So the enzymatic function of RAS is it's a GTPase. Okay? So even though it's got this change in structure, the actual smaller cleft within the RAS protein, it's a GTPase. And if you remember, it hydrolyzes GTP to GDP. Okay, it's got some helper proteins that does that, but the catalytic activity comes from RAS. Okay, so RAS is a GTPase. Now, if you knock out the ability of RAS to hydrolyze GTP, then you're encouraging RAS to stay in the GTP form because you've, you've knocked out the hydrolysis function. GTP bound RAS is the active form, so effectively the drug would make RAS more active. Okay, so even though we know the three-dimensional structure of the, the RAS protein, we know it's got a cleft so it's druggable, it makes no sense to drug this particular protein because the GTPase activity is involved in turning RAS from the on state to the off state. And if you drug that, you basically lock the protein in the on state, which will drive growth at a higher rate so it makes no sense to target that. Now, the same can be said of some tyrosine kinases. So we, we know that there's a lot of tyrosine kinases in cells, and some of them can be targeted specifically over others to some degree. Now, not all tyrosine kinases activate other things. So typically, we just say, well, you phosphorylate something, you turn it on. It's not as simple as that. Sometimes you phosphorylate something and you turn it off. So sometimes the 
the, the, the effect of the tyrosine kinase is to turn something off. So if you're turning off growth because of this kinase, you don't want to then target that kinase with a drug because you want the kinase to be able to turn things off. So depending on the particular kinase, you've got to understand the role that kinase plays in the pathway. And if it's, um, an, if it's involved in turning things on, then target it. If it's involved in turning pathways off, don't target it. Okay? So you've got to understand the role these proteins play in pathways to help you decide whether it should be targeted, even though they're druggable. So RAS is druggable, some of these kinases are druggable, but you don't want to turn them off. Therefore, you don't design drugs for them, even though you can. Okay? So you've got to pick your targets carefully. Now, I was saying earlier that transcription factors are typically not druggable because they bind to DNA over large surface area, and it's hard to disrupt that with a small molecule. There is an exception to that, which are nuclear hormone receptors. So without going into how nuclear hormone signaling works, um, suffice to say the, the, um, the hormone is able to cross the barrier, the plasma membrane, without, a, um, without relying on a, a receptor molecule that's in the plasma membrane. It can dissolve through the plasma membrane. So the, the hormone binds directly to the transcription factor. So the, if you think of a hormone, they're fairly small molecules, okay? And it's easy to mimic those molecules with chemistry to make an analog to these hormones, and therefore you can compete with the binding sites of these hormones. So you've got a protein, it binds to testosterone or estrogen or something, and it goes and activates DNA transcription. You use one of these drugs, you replace the, the, the hormone with the chemically synthesized drug that knocks out the ability for it to go and do its job. So even though it's a transcription factor which has this you know, large you know, binding domain for DNA, you're actually targeting a cleft that, that would bind a, one of these hormones. So these receptor proteins are vulnerable to disruption because we understand what the, the role the um, that the hormone plays, and it's easy to make an analog. Well, I won't say it's easy, but you can make analogs to replace and displace the, um, the hormone. And an example would be um, tamoxifen for that. So a lot of um, modern molecular biology, a lot of time and effort is spent on identifying networks of protein-protein interactions. So, um, you know, so if you think about it, for each protein in the cell, we are starting to identify the proteins that particular protein interacts with. So we're making these big matrices of 35,000 genes by 35,000 genes, and we know that this protein interacts with this protein, but this protein doesn't interact with that protein. So there's lots of great experimental techniques, lots of high th throughput techniques, lots of great you know, genome-wide techniques have been applied to identifying protein-protein interaction networks. And it, it's been a hot topic for 10, 15 years in molecular biology. So we've got these big networks of protein-protein interactions that are well understood. So the question is now, can we start to um, apply drug design to disrupt protein-protein interactions? So you can think of, you know, signaling pathways as a sequential linear run of protein-protein interactions. Okay, So these techniques are starting to identify some of these interactions. So for instance, an SH2 domain of one protein binding to a, phos to a, a tyrosine or a phospholipid tyrosine of another protein sets up these protein-protein interactions. We know that cycling proteins bind very strongly to cycling-dependent kinases. We know that Retinoblastoma binds to histone deacetylases. We know that the SOS protein binds to GRB2. And there's thousands of these interactions that are being identified. So there's lots of targets here. So um, that's going to um, hopefully pay off for trying to design um, 
drugs to disrupt these networks and therefore interfere with pathways known to be involved in driving cell growth. So um, people are trying to do this. One of the difficulties of designing drugs for protein-protein interaction networks is typically the surface where the two proteins are interacting is a large surface. So relative to the size of these small molecules that can get into these enzymatic clefts, they have trouble um, when it comes to these larger domains. So a cleft might be this big on a protein you know, surface, whereas the, a binding domain of two proteins might be that big you know, over the whole surface. So it becomes too big an interaction to disrupt. doesn't say it can't be done, but it, it involves multiple points of contact. And these extend over a large surface area. But there are examples of um, small molecules that have disrupted important protein-protein interactions, which, sort of like I was saying, it's it's a it's a area of science that hopefully will give us some good outcomes. So, for instance, um, there's a, there's an interaction between um, MDM2 and p53, and this is well characterized as being you know p53 being the guardian of the genome. It's it detects protein damage and it triggers apoptosis or cell growth depending on you know various signals so it's an important interaction here and people have designed a drug shown here that binds to um, disrupt the interaction between these two proteins so that's a good example another example comes from um, knocking out the function of a protein that's an anti apoptotic protein so remember apoptosis, a pro-apoptosis can drive cells to undergo this program of cell death. Anti-apoptotic proteins stop that process. So if you can knock out the anti-apoptotic factor, you can allow apoptosis to proceed. So it turns out that T has you know, a bunch of um, compounds in it which We've always said, oh, a cup of tea is good for you. Well, it turns out that tea contains a compound which at low doses can knock out one of these anti-apoptotic proteins and therefore can allow apoptosis to occur. 